Sam Han today giving us a talk on metabolic bone disorders. Now, Mr. Didwadi is a, a senior registrar at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Um, now, bone, metabolic bone disorders is a very important topic um, for the FRCS, um, FRCS exam. It's very easy to get tripped over, so please, please pay attention. Um, we're going to hopefully break it down nice and simple for you so it will protect you well, get you well prepared for the exam. Um, now, um, also as well, potential good sources for knowledge of the exam for metabolic bone diseases does include our FRCS Concise Orthopedic Notebook. So please, please, uh, uh, get, uh, you can get this on Amazon as a download as well. Um, so I do recommend it. Okay. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, pass you on to Mr. Bidwadi. Okay. Uh, hi, David. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'll start my screen share. Yep. Hi, uh, so good evening everyone. As uh, David has rightly said, it is uh, not one of the most comfortable topics when it comes to your exit exam. So hopefully this uh, talk today will ease, the, ease in your preparation. This is not would be very relevant for your clinical practice, but yeah, this should be sufficient enough for clearing the hurdle of FRCS. Yeah, uh, no, uh, no disclosures to begin with. And uh, as we know this, uh, part of orthopedics would be very relevant for both your MCQs and the uh, YY examination as well. Uh, so to begin with, uh, on your YY table, your examiner might ask, uh, can you tell me about the normal bone metabolism? I can't emphasize enough here that you will need to draw and speak together. How uh, would I say? Uh, the vitamin D enters in the body via food and skin. Uh, it is hydroxylated by liver by 25 hydroxylase. Uh, it is then acted upon from the kidney and is made into an active form of vitamin D, which is the 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol. Uh, this active form of vitamin D uh, brings about calcium and phosphorus absorption from the gut, which in turn increases the calcium level in the blood. Uh, what are the other ways by which the calcium level increases in the blood? The one is by calcium and phosphorus resorption from the bone and the calcium uh, reabsorption from the kidney. Both of these are regulated by parathyroid hormone, which is uh, in turn secreted by parathyroid glands. Uh, so this high calcium level in the body uh, act by negative feedback mechanism and uh, suppresses the P PTH in, in, in the clinical context of hypercalcemia. So that is what would be relevant here. So having known the background of your normal bone metabolism, uh, we would start with, sorry, osteoporosis. Uh, when it comes to definition, uh, WHO is very clear about uh, how to define, how it is defined osteoporosis. It's a skeletal disease characterized by age-related decrease in bone mass per unit volume with a disrupted microarchitecture. Consequently, there is increase in bone fragility and susceptibility to low trauma fractures. Question can be, uh, tell me what a T-score is, you will be handed over a prop like this, uh, showing a bone mineral density, showing the T-scores on the right side and the age on the x-axis. A T-score is essentially a number of standard deviation above or below the mean bone mineral density for a sex and race match healthy population. It can be used as a guide whether a patient is osteopenic or osteoporotic and whether they need to commence a treatment. In the context and background of the T-score, a Z-score is a similar as T-score, uh, which is a number of standard deviation above or below the mean B BMD for a sex and race, but for an age match population. So for a 70 year old patient will be compared with a standard 70 year uh, population for that particular cohort. It, this definition will be very useful when in, in your VIVA context and what was revising near the exam. On the, on the background of uh, T-score and Z-score, osteopenia is defined as uh, L2 to L4 lumbar density of 1 to 1, 2.5 standard deviation below the peak bone mass of a 25-year-old individual. While osteoporosis is a lumbar density, which is more than 2.5 standard deviation below the peak bone mass of a 25-year-old individual. 
So what are the risk factors when it comes to osteoporosis? Uh, as, as we can't emphasize enough, and then it's an exam of structure and how well you uh, articulate it. So uh, have, have headings in mind. Risk factors can be primary, secondary. Primary are genetic, hormonal, environmental, and dietary, while secondary are for the persons with underlying medical conditions uh, on long-standing uh, drugs. Or it can be also classified as type 1 and type 2. Uh, the type 1 osteoporosis uh, happens uh, is very common around the menopause when there is a reduced levels of estrogen while a type 2 is uh, age related which happens 10 to 15 years later and essentially due to poor calcium absorption and a low turnover uh, investigation wise uh, uh, you need to know about plain x-ray that, that the fact that a 30 percent bone loss is required to manifest osteoporosis uh, during my uh, my exam when i had this the examiner took me directly to the dexa scan however it is worthwhile knowing about uh, the different uh, parameters here in which involves a uh, blood test involving uh, fbc bone profile prostate specific antigen myeloma screen use of alkaline phosphatase and 24-hour urinary calcium which, which then brings about to the meat of uh, the diagnosis, where, which involves a DEXA scan, uh, which in essence is a gold standard for diagnosis and management of the osteoporosis. And essentially, it measures an actual bone density, which is a, a mineral per surface area of the bone. How does it act? So, uh, in, in short, it's a twin X ray beam, uh, which are passed uh, through the uh, target of interest, in which would be a, a lumbar bone or proximal femur and the emerging strength is measured in two axis and that gives you a rough uh, an estimate of the DEXA scan. Uh, advantage wise it is uh, accurate as the patient is exposed to not a significant amount of radiation. It's quick and simple to perform. Uh, the British Orthopedic Association laid down some guidelines uh, for a patient who is less than 75 and one insufficiency fracture. Uh, they are sent for a DEXA scan. However, if you are having, you see a patient with more than 75 and one insufficiency, no need for a DEXA scan. You can straight away go ahead with treatment. Which brings us to the next question. What are the indications? When would you uh, send a patient or refer for a DEXA scan? Uh, so when there is a radiographic evidence of osteopenia, the, bo the BMI is less than 19 and a maternal history of hip fracture. And another important algorithm in, in this context is the FRAX tool, which is quite, again, often uh, uh, asked in the exam. It's an algorithm for a 10 years absolute fracture is given by the World Health Organization. It is based on a combination of independent uh, clinical risk factors and uh, BMD measured by the DEXA scan. The only caveat to this is uh, if uh, the clinical risk factors, even with the background of higher BMD, shows uh, more at risk for a fragility fracture than someone who has a low BMD without a risk factor. So they lay more emphasis on patients with the uh, risk factors for osteoporosis. Uh, having had this background, how would you treat a patient of osteoporosis? The treatment guidelines given by uh, uh, NICE are preventive and treatment. Everyone should be given a lifestyle modification advice, nutritional advice, exercise program, and false prevention for the geriatric population. The treatment can be uh, roughly into one which prevents your bone loss and one which stimulates the bone formation. Uh, calcium and vitamin D are, uh, in a sense, uh, having had known the mechanism, uh, reduces the bone resorption. Recommended daily allowance is 1200 to 1500 milligram of calcium and for vitamin D is a thousand international unit. The most uh, commonly asked drugs in this uh, in, in the treatment would be a bisphosphonates, uh, which inhibit the osteoclast and the uh, studies have shown that the hip fracture rate is reduced by 50%. As a clinician, the cautionary uh, measures here that it a chance of chronic kidney disease, uh, subtrochanteric fracture, which, which are prevented by bisphosphonate holidays in patient taking long, long term and a rare incidence of osteonecrosis of jaw. Uh, when it comes to mechanism of action of bisphosphonate, it is uh, divided into an, some having nitrogen and without the nitrogen. Non-nitrogen containing are not that common. Uh, they act by causing apoptosis by accumulation of ATP metabolites within the cells while the one nitrogen containing inhibit the production of cholesterol, which in turn interferes with the cell membrane. 
the examples of this nitrogen containing are the one which is commonly used uh, include pimetronate, alindronate, zolindronate, and abandronate to name a few. Uh, apart from this bisphosphonates, uh, there uh, one needs to know about the second line or third line of uh, uh, drugs used for the treatment of osteoporosis, which includes the some uh, which are selective estrogen receptor modulators, uh, estrogen therapy, which would be very uh, sex specific, calcitriol and calcitonin. Uh, the other mechanism by which uh, uh, osteoporosis is treated by stimulating bone formation. The role of physical activity can't be enhanced, uh, can be em can't be emphasized enough. Uh, while uh, the other is teriparatide, which is a recombinant parathyroid hormone. Uh, the way it acts is by increasing the bone formation and microarchitecture and reducing the incidence of uh, vertebral and non-vertebral fractures. Uh, the other uh, relevant metabolic bone disorders is uh, osteopetrosis, uh, which is a marble bone disease. Uh, as I said, it would be easier to break, break this down when you compare all these different uh, metabolic bone disorders into uh, suitable headings, which, which would be useful when it comes to revising for this exam. So in a sense, to know what it is, uh, it is an increased bony sclerosis uh, followed with loss of medullary canal. Why does it happen? Due to impaired osteoclast function. Genetical background wise, uh, most of the patients seen in clinical practice are autosomal dominant because autosomal recessive can be infantile malignant variant. Um, they are in benign form and the autosomal uh, dominant give a residual uh, of a lifelong risk of fractures that heal poorly. Uh, they are also known the autosomal dominant uh, also known as Albert Schoenberg disease and histologically the osteoclast here lack the ruffled border which impairs uh, their action. Uh, radiology wise, uh, uh, there is an increase in bone density. Uh, you have wide cortices, a narrow medullary canal. So as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, you need to have an additional set of instrument as the bone is really hard uh, to ream. Another quite uh, often asked and uh, important is the pagets. So again, uh, know what it is. It is an imbalance between your osteoblast and the osteoclast activity is opposite of what we uh, discussed in the osteopetrosis. Epidemiology-wise, it has been seen traditionally in the, uh, in the mining communities in the Lancashire uh, population. There has been some evidence of uh, viral etiology to it with uh, measles. Breaking down the pathophysiology, it will be worthwhile knowing the mnemonic as lab, uh, which uh, the disease process, uh, in a sense, starts in the lytic phase, uh, wherein there is increase. Uh, it starts with increase in the osteoclast size and the number, which leads to increased bone resorption. It is followed by the compensatory active phase, which is the attempt of the body to uh, compensate the lytic phase. There is 40 times uh, increase in the uh, bone activity. However, the end end result is a disorganized woven bone. So you have area of sclerosis and relative osteopenia along with increased blood flow and fibrous tissue formation. Uh, resultantly, it turns out into a burnt out phase wherein you are left with a dense mosaic pattern of bone with little cellular activity. Here, the matrix is brittle and the fracture healing is uh, elsewise quite slower. So Clinically, uh, most of them remain asymptomatic and are picked up uh, quite late. Uh, you have bone pain, quite unrelated to the activities, and you have secondary osteoarthritis, which might be picked up when, when this sees an uh, orthopedic surgeon or a primary care physician, or in younger age, they can come with deformities. You can have uh, pathological fractures, uh, now compression, spinal stenosis can result in, uh, come with a rarely corda equina, uh, from the medical background, they, they have a high incidence of high output cardiac failure. And, and the later on, there is a 30% increase risk of osteosarcoma when compared to the uh, normal population. Uh, investigation wise, uh, blood parameters for this uh, page, it's, uh, would be uh, raised serum alkaline phosphatase, which is a marker of osteoblast, acid phosphatase, which is in turn a marker of osteoclast and urine parameters. How do you uh, recognize this pathology early in your disease process wherein uh, there will be lytic phases in the bone, uh, classical sign uh, described, which is quite, uh, uh, MCQ might be relevant for it, would be a candle flame area of porosis and metaphysis, also known as a, a flame or a arrow sign. Later on in the burnt out and the uh, phase, you have uh, 
thick and sclerotic cortices and there is loss of corticomedullary differentiation with widened bones and bowing of uh, the long medullary so treatment uh, as an orthopedic surgeon what what uh, do you know need to know and what you need to know for the exam uh, so when we are planning elective orthopedic surgery uh, this uh, like arthroplasty a spinal stenosis and nerve entrapment and the treatment is required for prevention of fractures uh, so bisphosphonates are a mainstay of medical management when would you do it and why would you do it so the uh, the guidelines are you start two to three months before your planned elective surgery uh, what is the rationale you don't want to operate on a patient who is in the active phase of the disease you want to convert the lytic phase to the burnt out phase and uh, bisphosphonate also normalize the bone turnover which makes the elective surgery easy you would do standard operation as you would do for a patient including uh, rf osteotomy or arthroplasty so some factors uh, when when it comes to planning arthroplasty like elective surgery for a patient uh, would uh, for a pa patient of pagets you would essentially divide into either surgeon factor patient factor anesthetist factor uh, and you would do pre op bloods including uh, 2d echo which for uh, as we know about the high incidence of high output cardiac failure surgeon factor it's a complex uh, case uh, need of mdt for pre op deformity analysis um, planning osteotomy uh, involving the rheumatologist uh, uh, or or the physician uh, including for the timing of the surgery intraoperatively you would need to order uh, an extra sets of reamers uh, cemented uh, would be uh, good in the case of bleeding and hemostasis and uh, as a patient factor the needs to counsel about the risk of wound healing delay and use of cell salvage for excessive bleeding the other way to pick it, uh, to structure this an exam would be either depending on timing of surgery uh, planning for surgery pre op factors intra op factors post op factors this would be the same as what we just uh, discussed in the last slides what does the evidence uh, say uh, for uh, pagets uh, assume it's a, it's a challenging uh, operation for a day one orthopedic surgeon so yeah uh, mdt approach long leg -like films uh, if the hospital doesn't have them it is necessary to have a ct scanogram uh, have the ap and the lateral views some recent evidence uh, suggest uh, use of uncemented implants as there had been reports of increased uh, uh, incidence of aseptic loosening with cemented implants however it is it is not beyond the doubt and uh, this results are in the uh, are not enough to give convincing evidence but it would be worthwhile knowing about them as we touched upon the malignant sarcomatous change it is uh, there is 30% higher risk uh, it happens in the uh, 1 to 6% of all patients with pagets it is more common in the diffuse uh, polyosteotic variants the prognosis uh, with this background is uh, very poor having in, uh, having discussed the osteoporosis the other uh, question would be about the osteomalacia what is uh, a difference between the two and uh, how would you find on biochemical testing so having studied the osteoporosis osteomalacia is an adult form of rickets that occurs as a result of impaired or deficient mineralization it is a sense a quality problem as opposed to a quantity problem in an osteoporosis uh, on biochemical testing in osteoporosis number uh, the normal while here in in uh, the serum calcium and phosphate are low and the alkaline phosphate is elevated the caveat here would be unless hypophosphatasia is the cause uh, uh, which uh, is difficult for anyone to uh, remember as would be so having said it is about a uh, adult form of rickets it's mainly due to dietary deficiency of vitamin d or calcium um, it leads to uh, it's a, in being a quality problem it leads to impaired mineralization of bone matrix and uh, as like an osteoporosis it leads to weakened bone and increased risk of pathology fragility fractures uh, serum calcium and phosphate are low in in biochemical parameters and the alkaline phosphate is, is elevated uh, another juvenile form of this is rickets uh, which uh, affects uh, it is an impaired mineralization of the cartilage matrix in the growth phase and it affects the zone of provisional calcification in the hypertrophic zone of the physis 
clinical features, there are generalized features and uh, head to toe features uh, for a patient uh, less than 18 months will, will present with failure to thrive, restlessness, hypotonia and a waddling gait. While the local features are from head to toe would be a uh, delayed closure of fontanel, a frontal and parietal bossing, a rachitic rosary, which is the prominence at the costochondral junction, uh, Harrison sulcus, uh, pigeon chest, pot belly, and a coxovara or a genu valgus. Uh, it would be worthwhile mentioning uh, uh, if, if you get this, uh, you would be expected to know the reason uh, for each of them. Uh, for the clinical feature of osteomalacia is more incidence onset than rickets. The bone pain initially is vague and non-specific, uh, and you can present with proximal muscle weakness. Uh, the radiology for rickets has many classical features, which involves uh, the physial widening, uh, metaphysial cupping, and decreased bone density, uh, which can be very apparent in the wrist x-rays or the knee x-rays. For osteomalacia, uh, this, uh, they have characteristic loser zones, uh, which in a sense is because of the stress on the compression side of the bone. And you have Milkman pseudo fractures, which, uh, in which because of impaired mineralization, the fractures have united, but not mineralized. Uh, some, uh, this would be relevant for the part one uh, for the FRCS, which is a vitamin D resistant rickets. Uh, uh, it's uh, uncommon, but it's the most common heritable version of rickets, uh, wherein it presents at one to two years. And uh, because of the dominant mutation, X-linked uh, domination, sorry, X-linked uh, mutation of uh, PHAX gene, there is inability of uh, renal tubules to absorb phosphate and resultant have uh, rickets. There's another variant uh, of vitamin D dependent, which is again rare, uh, but clinical features here are more severe. Uh, if we look, go into back into the uh, uh, mechanism of bone metabolism, the type two is wherein the intracellular act, um, intracellular receptor, that is where the mutation happens. And in type one, there's mutation of the renal 25, one hydroxyl is the last step before the formation of active form of vitamin D. Uh, renal osteodystrophy is another which was a uh, very difficult as an orthopedic surgeon to understand. I've tried to make it simple here. Uh, this is uh, essentially a spectrum of disease uh, seen in patients with chronic renal diseases uh, and it's characterized by bone renal deficiency due to electrolyte and endocrine abnormalities. What you have here is a uh, hypocalcemia uh, because of the chronic renal disease, the damaged kidney cannot convert into its active form. And uh, because of uh, inability to excrete, there's hyperphosphatemia. Uh, there is result in hyperparathyroidism and uremia because of background of the chronic renal failure. You have uh, two forms of uh, renal osteodystrophy. The one with high bone turnovers, which is a high PTH. Uh, the mechanism of it is uh, damage to renal tubules because of the renal pathology, uh, wherein vitamin D synthesis affected, decreased calcium absorption, which uh, which leads to uh, uh, negative feedback loop, increased parathyroid hormone and bone turnover. The other one, uh, so we ended with a low serum calcium, excess parathyroid hormone and ectopic calcium deposition. The other variant is a low bone turnover variety for renal osteodystrophy where because of uh, because of uh, metals like aluminium, uh, there is a renal damage uh, and where PTH release is inhibited and you have resultant osteomalacia. So uh, two types, the high bone turnover and the low bone turnover. Uh, we To summarize, we will include a short uh, description about the hyper and the hypocalcemia. Uh, so hypercalcemia, um, you won't be expected to treat them, but uh, it would be worthwhile knowing the clinical features. Uh, the popular saying is bones, stones, crones, and moons, wherein uh, bones is for pain following excessive bone resorption. Uh, stones is uh, a renal calculi and with presence of polyuria, groans will be your gastrointestinal nausea, vomiting, constipation and pains, and moons will be the one for uh, patients uh, seen as manifestation, having lethargy and disorientation. Uh, causes of them uh, can be, again, uh, structure-wise, malignancy, uh, endocrine, a genetic anastia, uh, uh, due to uh, 
long standing steroids vitamin d intoxication and metabolic uh, disorders like sarcoidosis hypocalcemia again uh, it is worthwhile knowing the acute and the chronic features uh, uh, you you won't be expected to treat this uh, pathologies so they present with neuromuscular irritability which can present as twostic sign uh, a truzo sign uh, which is a uh, neuromuscular car wherein there is a carpopedal spasm following uh, low vascularity and a perioral anesthesia on an ecg parameter there will be a prolonged qt interval uh, if if this persists for a long time and chronically uh, patients can have cataract fungal infection uh, so that 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 would in a sense uh, uh, describe and conclude the talk as i said it's no matter meant to be an exhaustive lecture for treating a patient with metabolic bone disorder but this would in a sense uh, help to um, clear the F frcs a short slide about hypophosphatasia it is a, a rarer variant of metabolic bone disease which is characterized by generalized impairment of bone mineralization it is clinically it presents as similar to rickets but with in abnormal dentition uh, blood parameters wise there is low level of alkaline phosphatase which results in decrease synthesis of inorganic phosphate necessary for bone matrix formation so that's it my main uh, lecture was uh, done from this uh, book which we as a fasia mentor group uh, contributed uh, and uh, would be worthwhile uh, reading about it thank you Thank you very much, Rohan. So um, that was a brilliant talk. It went through qu quite good detail about the key sort of uh, metabolic bone diseases that come up regularly in the exam. It also was interesting how uh, it reminded me how um, everything is connected. So we discussed basic science of the viva table. We had um, we had uh, osteoporosis, which can quite happily turn up on the trauma the trauma table, talking about fragility fractures. Then you had adult pathology with Paget's disease. And then you also had, as well, rickets. So the pediatric yeah, table. Pediatrics. Um, the key thing is it crosses all boundaries. So with any basic science topic, you have to think, can, where else will this turn up in the exam? It's not just going to be limited to the basic science table. Um, and a very good way of doing well on the basic science table is attributing any basic science topic to a clinical picture and vice versa. If you have a clinical picture and you can break it down into the basic science, you're going to, um, you're going to do, do well with the examiners. Okay. Yeah. Very well explained, David. That, that summarized it very well. Now, just to reassure everyone, this, uh, I assume a few people did join later. This has been recorded and will show up on, um, the FRCS mental website. So please, please do look, go through this again. Even if you were here at the beginning, it's really important. And Rohan, this, went through it very, very well and made it very easy and explainable. Okay. Now, um, we have got one volunteer for the, the Viva. 